Well, what I want to do this evening is to take you in a fairly fast and a very simple way through some very fundamental things. A couple who hadn't long become Christians, he from Marxism when the communist empire collapsed and she from the Watchtower movement, sat down in my lounge and launched into their first and most pressing question. It was a very simple one and it went like this. Tell us, they asked, what is the Bible all about? Well, how would you respond to that? Well, actually, it's not too difficult if you think about it. The Bible tells us how everything got started at the beginning of time and then how everything went wrong when Adam and Eve broke God's rules and spoiled it for the rest of us. God had to punish to show that sin mattered, but along with the punishment, he gave the promise that one day an offspring from a woman would come to crush Satan and set things right again. That, of course, is Genesis 3.15. The whole of the Old Testament shows us how God begins that rescue plan, and each book takes us a little bit more closer to the fulfillment of that plan. It nudges us a little bit closer to the end. It's like a series of signposts pointing on to the coming of Christ. And then the New Testament shows us the fulfillment of the plan when Christ came to make possible the reconciliation of failed sinners with a holy God, and that, as you all well know, is John 3.16, and it leaves us instructions for Christians to live in this present world until Christ comes a second time to establish the new heavens and the new earth in which there will only be righteousness. That's what the Bible is all about. Genesis 3.15, John 3.16, just about says it all. What follows is merely a primer. So I'm going to start by apologizing in advance to those who learn nothing new for the next half hour. And uh, at least I hope you will be encouraged at the reminder of God's great grace in providing for us a collection of books called the Bible that are fixed in their number, are divine in their origin, and are universal in their authority. Now, if I were to ask the question this evening, what do you think, at the moment, is the world's most popular book? Well, some of you kids may well be ahead of their parents, and you'll say, well, uh, probably that is the most popular book at the present time. And how do we decide which is the world's most popular book? Well, we could do it on sales, immediate sales. You may be interested to know that on the 21st of July, that sounds like two days' time, 12 million copies will come onto the bookshelves of our stores of this impressive Harry Potter. That's not a bad number, 12 million books. Well, we could, of course, compare it with poor Paddington Bear, who only managed 50 million copies since he arrived from Peru 30 years ago. So he's not really quite in the running either. You could decide it on the wealth of the author. Undoubtedly, J.K. Rowling is earning a lot of money. Many millions. But there's another way of looking at it. You could ask the question, how many languages has the book been translated into? Harry Potter, 63 out of almost 7,000 known languages in the world today. 63 translations is not too bad. But what about the other book, the Bible? Been translated into 422 out of almost 7,000 languages and rising. Wycliffe Bible translators have 5,500 personnel working on every continent, currently pu publishing one New Testament every 17 days in a new language. Some people somewhere must think it's very important. There's no other book that has exerted such a widespread influence upon the art, the literature, and the music of the Western world than the Bible. Until recent decades, it would be impossible to understand the culture of Western nations without understanding the impact of the Christian scriptures. Volumes have been written, and they continue to be written, with the, this book as their foundation. Books on science and history, trivial novels, serious inquiries, plays, poetry, prose, drama, and each year thousands of books pour off our presses of all languages with the Bible as their central theme. 
It's the Bible that molded our English language as we know it. This honor does not, as some people erroneously think, belong to Shakespeare. Shakespeare was familiar with a translation known as the Geneva Bible, and he allowed it to shape his use of the language. Every day, English-speaking people across the world are using phrases and expressions that are straight out of the Bible, uh, though they mostly are quite unaware of this. Feet of clay, tell it not in gath, iron sharpens iron, a drop in a bucket for such a time as this, faithful are the wounds of a friend, a wolf in sheep's clothing, an angel of light, escaping by the skin of my teeth, lick the dust, killing the fatted calf, our days are numbered, the writing on the wall, uh, and so on and so on, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And words such as shibboleth and scapegoat and exodus and promised land, they've just slipped into our language straight out of the Bible. Even Bible characters are more often quoted than known. Adam's apple, Samson's strength, Job's comforters, David and Goliath, the wisdom of Solomon, Daniel in the lion's den, doubting Thomas and a Judas. In fact, I don't know whether you have it in America, but we have golden syrup in England, and on every single tin of Tate and Lyle's golden syrup, you will have a Bible text. Though I heard a program on the radio recently, and it was quite clear that the person concerned had no idea that it was a Bible text. It comes from Judges 14 and verse 14. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. However, more than all of this, the Bible, remember, is the handbook of Christianity. If we want to know what Christians believe, and if Christians want to know how they should live, it's to the Bible they must turn. And in every area of life, it is assumed that a manual must be free from error if it's going to be useful. In addition, unless it is for specialists only, it must also be straightforward to understand. Oh, there may be some very difficult parts in it that require particular care if the true meaning isn't to be lost, but taken as a whole, a handbook which is intended to inform ordinary readers must be clear and uncomplicated. And if those ordinary readers are to be found in a, among a wide diversity of cultures, then it's going to be quite a remarkable publication. It's got to be unusual in its plainness and universal in its appeal. And if, in addition to all this, the manual is compiled over a period of some 1,600 years of human history and yet remain wholly consistent with itself in every part, then by all reckoning, it is going to be a remarkable handbook. The Bible stands alone among all books ever written in meeting these requirements. The Bible also stands alone among books, not only by reason of its clarity, its longevity, and its popularity, but because of the opposition that it attracts to itself. All through its history, even while it was being written, its enemies have tried to destroy it, it's been burned, banned, its readers have been imprisoned and murdered for reading it. And no book in the history of writing has been so more analyzed, criticized, and ridiculed. Why? Well, certainly not because it's a book of low moral standards that encourages people to rebel against governments and rulers. It isn't the Bible that spawns terrorism, supports the corru corruption, and cheers the idol. On the contrary, no book has ever been written that maintains such a consistently high standard of morality over such a long period of time. It took 1,600 years to, for the Bible to be written. It takes just a few seconds to destroy a copy. And yet it is still the best-selling book the world has ever known. More copies of the complete Bible are printed and distributed each year in more than 400 languages than any other book. Why then has the Bible been so bitterly attacked? Well, because it is what it claims to be the reliable, inerrant revelation of God, whose message is demanding. It must be destroyed or else obeyed. There is no alternative. So, let's turn to our Bible for a moment. It's a collection of 66 books, as you know, by 40 different writers over 1,600 years. And yet it has one big story and just one author, God. 
Well, the Jews had their Hebrew scriptures. They numbered them differently, but all our 39 Old Testament books were theirs and no more, most of it written in Hebrew. It was completed around 400 years BC with the book of Malachi. And of course, Christianity adopted those same Jewish scriptures. And then they added the four gospels, the life of Christ, the acts of the apostles, the life of the first Christians, and those wonderful letters from leaders, instructions for the churches. And how exciting to know that when you read one of the New Testament letters, you're reading a letter in real life, not just wise sayings, but a letter for real life. But what's the Bible all about? Well, like all books, it has a beginning and it has an end, and it has a middle. Most books have that, don't they? The Bible is no different. Let's have a look at the beginning. The beginning tells us how the universe started. It tells us how the human race started. Know your origins, and you'll know your destination, and you'll have an idea of the route between the two. Well, try this one out. You're going for a walk one day in the snowy weather and you come to a crossroads, you're in unfamiliar territory, and you find that the signpost has broken down. Which way will you choose? How are you going to know which of the other three routes you can take? Well, it isn't difficult because you're a smart person, so you can pick it up quite easily. All you have to do is pick up the signpost, put the arm that you know is down the road you've come from in its place, and all the other three will point in the direction that they should. In other words, if you know your origin, you can find your way to your destination, and you can find the route in between quite easily. There's a very simple equation. It goes like this. Origin plus destination equals root. And isn't that exactly where our society has tragically gone wrong today? We're confused about, about our origins. Therefore, we've no idea about our destination and we make such a mess of what lies in between. If you think you came from a monkey, you behave like a monkey. That's the tragedy. If you know you're created in the image and likeness of God, and you are accountable to that God, it might just affect what lies between the two. The Bible also tells us, of course, how sin and suffering started. Dr. Sherwin Newland, the US bioethicist, in his book, The Wisdom of the Body, marvels at the miracle of the human body. And he says, it is miracle with flaws. Well, we know where the miracle came from. As a matter of fact, we know where the flaws came from as well. We have an explanation for both. Oh, and then, of course, the Bible tells us how the rescue plan started. Genesis 3.15, the promise. John 3.16, fulfillment. And the Bible has an end. It tells us how everything will be wrapped up at the end. It tells us how God will bring his plans to a perfect conclusion with a new heavens and a new earth, entirely without pain and suffering and cruelty, in which only righteousness dwells and the Lord himself will be there. You know, I don't know how much you know about the book of Ezekiel. Uh, I have a bit of problems with some parts of the book of Ezekiel. They're the hard parts. I, I frankly, frankly have to say I don't understand it all, but I'll tell you what I really do understand. I understand the last two words of the book of Ezekiel. The last two words in the Hebrew is very simply Yahweh Shammah, and it simply means the Lord is there. That's how it's all going to end up for the Christian. The Lord is there, Yahweh Shammah. Oh, and the Bible has a middle as well. God's solution to the problem of sin and suffering, 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus Christ, and a bit before Abraham as well. A special people in a special place, Israel in Canaan. A special people in a special tribe. A special David in Judah, a special child in a special town. Jesus in Bethlehem. Isn't it wonderful that the Bible is full of stories with colorful characters and real-life drama? It's not a boring book at all. The Bible is totally honest. 
Even its heroes are shown to be men and women who can slide into bad ways when they ignore the maker's instructions. And you know that's unique in ancient literature. No ancient literature ever records the failures of their kings and their heroes, only the Bible. In ancient literature, you never record anything that is negative, because if you record it, you perpetuate it. So, as I'll show you later in the week, there are evidences of them scoring out whole dynasties in Egypt because they were, in their mind, bad guys, and so they never existed. The Bible isn't like that. It's very honest. A primary purpose of the Bible is to reveal the sort of God we're reading about, and we can see this in creation and in the laws of God and in the life of Christ and in the letters of the disciples. We see it in creation, a God of unlimited power and wisdom. We see it in the laws that he's given us, a God of moral standards who tells us how best we are to live. We see it in the history, and there's lots of history, a God who cares, a God who rewards and punishes and is in control. We see it in the life of Christ, a God of compassion and care. We see it in the letters of the apostles, a God who's concerned for every part of life. And then finally, we see it in the revelation of John, a God who's written the very last chapter of history. But why do Christians believe that the Bible is true? Well, first of all, because of its own claims. 400 times in the Old Testament, the Bible says, this is what the Lord says. Jesus said to his disciples, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. Paul once claimed, we speak not in words of human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Peter wrote, not cleverly invented myths, he said, but we were eyewitnesses. And John declared, we proclaim what we have seen. Oh, and by the way, in case you're thinking, but that sounds like self-authentication. That's like putting a man in the dock and saying this man is innocent because he says he is. How can you use that? It's an argument in circles. Well, hold on a moment. You're using it all the time. Every time you say, I think, you're using self-authentication. Nobody else knows what you're thinking. And they'll either believe you when you tell us what you're thinking, or they won't believe you. And they'll make a judgment on whether they believe you or don't believe you by how honest you normally are. If you're a liar, then they're not going to believe you. But if you're always honest, they will believe you. You're using self-authentication every day of your life. So don't let anybody tell you you can't use that. Every time you say, I think, I dreamt last night, nobody else can do it, tell us except you. So if this is God's word, and God tells us, who is greater than God to confirm what he has said? Where did the Bible come from? Well, you should know that the best text for this is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. Now, I know some translations have inspired. It's not actually, I have to tell you, the best translation of it. Let's do a little bit of Greek together. Here's a nice word, theopneustos. God breathed is what it means. It's made up of two words, theo, God, and pneustos, from which we get pneumonia and pneumatic, which is to do with breathing and air, or lack of. And this is a passive word. It's not actually inspiration, it's expiration. And if you don't know the difference between inspiring and expiring, you'll find out one day. This is God's word breathed out by him. That's actually the origin. You don't go to 2 Timothy 3.16 to find out how we got the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells you how, where it came from. God breathed. It claims God is its author. But if you want to know how we got it, well, you'll go to 2 Peter 1.21, won't you? Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a definition of how the Bible came to us. It goes like this. The Holy Spirit moved men to write. He allowed them to use their own language, their own style, their own gifts, and their own culture. But the Holy Spirit overruled in the expression of thought and the choice of words, so that they recorded accurately all that God wanted them to say and exactly how he wanted them to say it. And the Bible is therefore a harmony of the active mind of the writer and the sovereign direction of the Holy Spirit. But does it matter? 
Well, can we have a reliable message in an unreliable story, or a, a, a reliable savior in an unreliable history, or a reliable salvation in an unreliable message, or a re reliable authority in an unreliable text? Let's face it, the church without a reliable authority is like a crocodile without teeth. It can open its mouth as wide as it likes, but who cares? And what's the Bible for? The scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Doesn't seem to leave too much out, does it? The Bible is essential, we are told, for salvation. It reveals God, ourselves, and our Savior. For teaching, it is the foundation for what we believe. Convicting, it's the test of all our actions. Correcting, it's the checklist for living and training. It's the rod of discipline. How do we know that the Bible is true? Well, there are two ways we can listen to the book. There is a kind of ring of truth, if you like, about the scriptures. Uh, it speaks with authority. And so many have given their lives to read it. William Tyndale was put on trial for translating the Bible, tied to a stake, garroted, and then burnt in October 1536. Why? So that you and I should have a Bible translated from the Greek, printed, and in a language we could read. And during the period of the Soviet occupation of much of the world, Christians would do anything to keep a little Bible with them. The one you're looking at, if you want to know, it's just 55 millimeters long, uh, five centimeters. It's a tiny plastic gospel of John. Uh, the idea is you could hide it almost anywhere. You could stuff it in the cistern if you wanted to, leave it there, and a day or two later you could get out. The one you're looking at, I left in a glass of water overnight, and it's as perfect as it went in. Why did they bother? Because it mattered. Because it was a book that was important. And thousands and millions of Christians across the world today are longing to have a Bible that they can trust, and they de they're denied it. And of course, you can do it by listening to the book, but you can also do it by weighing the evidence. I want to tell you very briefly about two very smart guys. Here's the first one. His name is Robert Dick Wilson. Uh, he was a professor of Semitic philology of Princeton Theological Seminary in the United States of America. Uh, Semitic philology sounds very important. Uh, you don't have to understand it, it's just very important. Uh, and uh, he was an armchair scholar. He read up the past. He divided his academic life into three periods of equal periods of 15 years. The first 15 years, he was going to learn every language related remotely to the Old Testament. The second 15 years, he was going to read all the documents that were available, and in the third 15 years, he was going to publish. So he started. He set out to learn a few languages. He learned, just as a sort of starting point, he learned German and Italian and Portuguese and Spanish and French, and he went on to learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic, and then he added Babylonian, Ethiopian, Phoenician, Syriac, and then concluded with Egyptian, Armenian, Persian, Coptic, and a few more. As a matter of fact, in the end, he learned 26 languages and dialects. How's your French getting on? Then he spent 15 years using those languages to study all available material linked with the Bible, and then 15 years publishing his results. His conclusion? I try to give my students such an intelligent faith in the Old Testament scripture that they will never doubt them as long as they live. And he said, no man knows enough to assail the truthfulness of the Old Testament. The other man, is Sir William Ramsey, very different from Robert Dick Wilson. Dick Wilson was brought up to believe the Bible. This man was brought up not to believe the Bible. Sir William Ramsey was what I call a bucket and spade scholar, whereas the other one read up the past, this one dug up the past. 
He was uh, quite a bright guy, as it happens. He was professor at Oxford and Aberdeen universities, gained three honorary fellowships from Oxford, nine honorary doctorates from British Continental and American universities, gained the Victorian Medal of the Royal Geographic Society in 1906, was a founder member of the British Academy, and was knighted in 1906 for his service to archaeology. And there were a few other things, but they wouldn't fit on the screen. And he spent a lifetime digging up Asia Minor. These were the lands of the Apostle Paul. He was told to believe that Luke, the writer of the, gospel, of the Gospel and also the Acts of the Apostles, would be completely in error in most of his facts. And he dug up the lands of the Apostle Paul's travels and Luke's record in the Acts of the Apostles, and he came to this conclusion. He said, you may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond that of any other historians, and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. Christianity did not originate in a lie, and we can and ought to demonstrate this as well as believe it. The evidence convinced him. I want to give just two illustrations of the past. I want to tell you, first of all, about a king who never existed. That doesn't look as though it's going to go very far, does it? A king who never existed. You see, until 1843, the only reference in known history to a king called Sargon was in one verse of the Bible, Isaiah 20 and verse 1. And so it was assumed, quite seriously, that no such person ever existed. It was simply a make-up, a name, out of random. Then, in that year, 1843, Paul Bota was digging around in Korsabad, 15 miles north of Nineveh in modern-day Iraq, and he discovered the remains of a temple and a library belonging to an ancient king of Assyria called guess who? Nobody ever denies him today. I can take you and show you this in the British Museum. Uh, he's now one of the best known kings of the ancient world. Guarding his palace, he had two of these massive 15 feet high, 10 ton human headed winged bulls. That's not bad, is it, for a king who never existed to build a 15 foot high, 10 ton human headed winged bull and a pair of them as well. And then I want to tell you briefly about an order that never, was never given. Luke 2. You know what happened in Luke 2, don't you? It was long assumed that a Roman emperor would never issue an order for a census as described in Luke 2, where every man went to his town to register. What a load of nonsense. No, no Roman emperor is going to ask people to do that. Oh, really? Well, that's what they thought until this papyrus decree was discovered in Egypt, which is an order for a Roman census in Egypt at the time of Trajan in AD 104, which mirrors the order of Augustus in Luke 2 almost exactly. And the prefect Gaius Maximus orders all those in his area to, guess what, return to their own homes for the purpose of a census. But let me just underscore this fact. We do not believe the Bible is true because of this. We do not believe the Bible is true because archaeologists have proved it. We believe the Bible is true because of far stronger and more certain evidence. It claims to be and is what it claims to be. Finally, I want to give you just very briefly nine reasons to trust the Bible. First of all, its accuracy demonstrates it. It's consistently being proved true. But as I repeat, that is not the reason why we trust it. We believe the Bible because of its own claim. Professor Wiseman, an internationally recognized archaeologist, uh, said recently, archaeology properly understood always confirms the accuracy of the Bible. And that's one of the greatest archaeologists we have. Its accuracy demonstrate. Its unity supports it. Uh, one great progressive story, relentlessly heading towards the fulfillment, the promise of Jesus Christ. Every book in the Bible neatly fitting together like a divine jigsaw, leading us, nudging us forward in the grand unfolding of God's revelation. And then, thinking minds endorse it. He is no fool who trusts the Bible, as Answers in Genesis shows, as the two guys I've just mentioned shows. You don't have to be embarrassed to believe God's word. Can you see where this, this is going? And human nature requires it. Remember the broken signpost? Origin plus destination equals root. 
and our society is desperately in need of a true understanding of its origin, its destination, and then it'll know how to fill in the gap in the middle. The tragedy is we've ignored God's word, so we have no idea what our origin is or where we're going, and we make such a dreadful mess of what lies between. And then, of course, our Savior taught it, and you cannot have any greater authority than that. He believed the Old Testament was true. He actually used it. And when Jesus told Old Testament stories, please always remember this. He was not teaching little stories for the tiny children to enjoy. Every Old Testament historical account that Jesus referred to, he was using it to bolster a doctrinal theological point. Check it out. He's always using it for teaching. And he never doubted it. And then Revelation confirms it. There is too much fulfilled prophecy to overlook. You know some of them. Isaiah 7:14, the promise of a virgin conceiving. Micah 5, verse 2, the very place where he's going to be born. Zechariah 9, 9, riding into the city on the back of a donkey. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, a psalm absolutely filled. Nobody doubts that Psalm 22 was written many centuries before Jesus was born. It's a Davidic psalm, so it's 900 years before Jesus was born. But if you want to be a liberal critic now to this evening, you still would say that Psalm 22 was written long Long before uh, Jesus of Nazareth was born, you read Psalm 22 when you go home tonight and see how it perfectly fits in with all that happened at, at Golgotha. And Jesus was not in a position then to dictate the terms. Oh sure, he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to fulfill the prophecy. He did that quite deliberately. He knew what he was doing. But he didn't have much control over the soldiers at the bottom of the, of, of the cross who were casting lots for his clothes or the wagging tongues and head. You read Psalm 22 and you'll see. And then, of course, its own claim demands it. It is self-authentication from the divine, from the almighty God, the one who created the heavens and the earth. And always remember, self-authentication is not wrong. You are using it all the time. Every time you say, I think, I dreamt last night, I wish, I want, that's self-authentication. People have got to believe you or disbelieve you. And the, its own claim demands that you trust it. And then, of course, the character of God secures it. Isn't it unthinkable that the God who created this incredibly complex universe and our incredibly complex mind and body then walked away and left no instructions for the best use of it? Does that make sense? And finally, your personal experience illustrates it. Many of you here, I hope all of you here, have found it's changed your life and it speaks to your circumstances. Whatever you need, God's word is there, speaking, challenging, changing you, correcting you, training you. It is, as we said right from the start, a unique book and it has a unique message and it's about a unique man. Keep that in mind. Thank you for listening.